Okay, so today's video is going to focus on different types of membranes and then mostly function of skin. The diagrams, the locations, the anatomy of the structures of the skin, you guys will focus on that on your own like you did with the different anatomical landmarks. So we're going to start with epithelial membranes. So I'll spell that for you real quick before we get going too far. So epithelial membranes... So we have three different types of epithelial membranes that we're going to talk about. That's an end. Okay, and we're going to talk about each one individually, but I want you to kind of be a little bit familiar with them right now. Uh, so the first one is a mucous membrane. That was supposed to be an M the first time. So the first one Okay, is a mucous membrane, and we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna look at all of these individually. I just want you to realize that we're gonna look at three types of epithelial membranes, and then we'll go look at a connective tissue membrane. Uh, the second one is a serous membrane, and the third one is actually our skin. It's the cutaneous membrane. So again, we're gonna look at all three of these individually, but I want you to realize that we're gonna start with what we call epithelial membranes. Epithelial membranes are all going to have kind of the same basic function, which is that they're going to provide lining or covering. So they're going to line things that open to the outside. They're going to cover organs. Okay, so these are membranes that are going to provide linings and coverings, uh, both internally and externally. Okay, so both for internal structures as well as structures that open to the outside. Okay, so all three of these epithelial membranes are gonna have this same characteristic, that they line or cover things, both internal and external, and that they contain okay, and that they're gonna contain epithelial tissue and we'll do tissues again after we do skin when we're hopefully here in person and can use the microscopes. Okay, so they'll contain epithelial tissue and what we call the basement membrane. Epithelial tissue is important because epithelial tissue is always going to have a free surface, which is part of why it's so good at... Um, you know, lining things and stuff. So, because it's always going to have a free surface. So, they're going to have epithelial tissue and they're going to have what they call a basement membrane. So, basically, you can think of all these membranes as having an anchored in membrane here and then cells anchored into it on top of it. Okay. And so, this would be the basement membrane here. And then the epithelial tissue would be the cells on the top. And there's lots of different kinds of epithelial tissue. And again, we'll backtrack into that when we go through tissues when we get access to the microscopes again. Okay, so, but we're going to start with these epithelial membranes that are going to provide these linings and coverings both internally and externally that will contain epithelial tissue as well as a basement membrane. Okay, and we're going to go through the three types, mucus, serous, and cutaneous. So our first one here is a mucous membrane, okay? And so a mucous membrane, again, is a type of epithelial membrane. So again, we're looking at an epithelial tissue here, epithelial membrane. And the mucous membrane is gonna line body cavities that open to the exterior, so that open to the outside, okay? And so that's gonna be really important. That's, gonna, that's a distinguishing characteristic of these. So these things that open to the outside, like the respiratory tract, you can see here how it's lining the nose, the mouth, the lungs, respiratory would open to the outside, digestive tract, you see in the esophagus, down into the stomach, uh, the small intestine, large intestine, rectum, they all open to the outside, okay? Urinary tract, right? Like you have the urethra that brings the urine from the bladder to the outside, that would be lined in epithelial uh, mucosa, right? So the mucous membrane that's made out of epithelial tissue, as well as reproductive tracts, right? Again, anything that is open to the outside is gonna be lined with this mucous membrane. 
And the reason it's gonna be lined with this mucous membrane is the mucous membrane is going to secrete mucus. Okay, and the benefit of that mucus is it's going to help keep the membrane, keep the tissue moist and lubricated. Okay, think about in the winter time, right? When it's really dry outside and your lips start chapping or cracking. Some people get like nosebleeds when it gets really dry. Okay, and so the mucus layer there is really important. Okay, it helps keep the moisture in the tissue. It helps prevent the tissue from drying out and cracking because all of your cells are meant to be in a wet environment. Um, it helps keep them lubricated. Okay, it offers, so it's gonna offer protection. So it can help trap substances, you know, in the nasal passages is where we think of that most often, right? So it can offer protection there, help trap um, foreign substances like bacteria, dust, okay, act as a filter, help act as a filter system. Okay, all of these are gonna be functions of this mucous membrane. Okay, this membrane is gonna consist again of an epithelial lining on top of that basement membrane. And again, what sets these membranes apart is that they open to the outside. So you can see our structure of a mucous membrane here and the parts that are important that we wanna pull out here is what we call this lamina propria. And that lamina propria is part of that basement membrane. This is the anchoring. Okay, so it's this part down here that's gonna anchor it in because as things move across the surface, they can start to tear and tug on the cells and it will prevent the cells from getting ripped out. The epithelial tissue is on the top. You'll notice it has its free surface here and it has this layer of mucus on it. And again, we'll get into detail about epithelial tissue later, but these are the two basic components of your mucous membrane. This basement membrane or the lamina propria, right? So the lamina propria and then that epithelial layer. And they'll secrete the mucus a for a variety of reasons. So the next one, again, it's another epithelial membrane is our serous membranes. Serous membranes are gonna line body cavities this time that are closed to the exterior. So not open and exposed to the air. So you can see in the diagrams here how it's lining in the abdomen, in the chest, that's where you're gonna see these things. Okay? So these line body cavities that are closed to the outside, okay? there are things like the pleura, which is around the lungs. Okay? So the pleura around the lungs, okay? the pericardium, right? pericardium here, which is gonna be around the heart. Okay? So the pleura around the lungs, the pericardium around the heart, Okay. Also, you have the peritoneum, which is basically around the viscera in the abdomen. Okay. These serous membranes are a double-layered membrane. We'll look at a picture of that in just a second. Okay. So these are a double-layered membrane, meaning that they're going to have one side of the membrane that's going to touch the organ itself. And then they'll have one side that's going to line the body cavities. These membranes are really important for reducing friction. They secrete what is called serous fluid. So they secrete the serous fluid, which is like a really thin kind of watery fluid that'll be between these two layers of membrane. And so that serous fluid, you'll notice all of these different organs, they move. Right, the lungs move as we breathe in and out. The heart moves as it beeps, beeps, and beats. The um, viscera and the abdomen moves as food moves through it. It adjusts to change shape. And so this double layer membrane here allows those organs to glide smoothly across the abdominal, the thoracic um, chest wall. So you'll notice all these membranes here, they have a parietal peritoneum and a visceral peritoneum. And you notice here we have a parietal pericardium and a visceral pericardium, and a parietal pleura and a visceral pleura. The visceral part is the one that's actually touching the organ. And you're going to need these examples of membranes, so make sure you get these examples down. The parietal one is the one that's actually touching the cavity wall. 
So again, we said this is a double layer. So in the abdomen, the parietal peritoneum is on the actual abdominal wall where the visceral peritoneum is touching the actual organs, right? Visceral pericardium touching the actual heart, parietal pericardium touching the cavity. Visceral pleura touching the lung, parietal pleura touching the thoracic cavity. So this diagram here shows you a little bit closer kind of what that looks like, right? So I have the visceral pericardium here actually touching the heart and the parietal pericardium, which would be touching the thoracic wall. I have this thin layer of serous fluid would be in between the two, not air like a balloon in that picture next to it, right? This thin layer of serous fluid so that as the heart beats, there is reduced friction and it glides nice and smooth. This membrane, this serous membrane, is made of a really, really thin layer of epithelial tissue on top of the membrane anchoring it in. The last epithelial membrane, so again, we still have an epithelial membrane. Remember, we had three of them. The last epithelial membrane here is the cutaneous membrane. The cutaneous membrane is just a fancy term for our skin. Right? And so our skin is going to be our final epithelial membrane that we're talking about. Okay? Um, we will talk obviously more in depth about it in just a little bit. Okay? But basically our skin is going to have multiple layers. Okay? And it's going to consist of an outermost layer. You can see it right here, this stratum corneum. Okay? An outermost layer that is what we call keratinized. And keratin is a protein that basically helps waterproof your skin. It helps keep you from losing water. Right? So this outermost layer is keratinized and it's really thick. You'll see how there's lots and lots of cells there. That's part of how we can, you know, have a little scratch and it not be a big deal and, you know, not you know, rip dirt down to the bone or anything like that. And then you'll notice the layer at the bottom that it's anchored into is also really thick so that it can um, really help hold and anchor those cells in there. Uh, and so we'll look at these individual layers a little bit closer in just a minute. Okay, the last type of membrane we're gonna talk about is not an epithelial membrane. This one is a synovial membrane. It is a type of connective tissue membrane. And again, when we talk about tissues, that will make a little bit more sense. So this one is a type of connective tissue. The epithelial membrane was a type of epithelial tissue membrane. So this one is a type of connective tissue membrane. Synovial membranes are really important when it comes to joints. Okay? Synovial membranes are going to line, um, you find them lining uh, these most of our, most of what we consider when we think of a typical joint, okay? um, And so you'll see the membrane here lining, okay, so it lines the joint cavity, right? So the joint is just the space in between the bones. So it lines the joint cavity, right? It helps kind of, it helps a little bit in holding the joint together. Okay? It lines the joint capsule, the edges of the joint, it lines um, any tendons or uh, bursa that wrap around it. Again, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about those when we talk about joints a little bit more. So any tendons or bursa, basically soft tissue that's going to be crossing the joint that might get frayed, okay? and it secretes synovial fluid. So how we have the serous membrane that releases that serous fluid, the synovial membrane releases synovial fluid, and that synovial fluid also decreases friction which is really important when you're talking about bone contact, right? We want the two ends of this bone to glide very smoothly across one another. Okay, so we've done all those different types of membrane. We have the three epithelial types of membranes, um, cutaneous, serous, mucous membranes, and then we have the synovial membrane. So now we're gonna, backtrack and, and we're going to focus more on this cutaneous membrane, basically on the skin. So it's going to be the rest of our focus. So I'm going to use this picture quite a bit. If you want to um, 
Yeah, if you want to pause at some point in time, use this picture to help you label your, you know, with your structural list, help you label your diagrams and go for it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more detail about our skin. So we're talking about our integumentary system. So integumentary is just our fancy term for skin here. So we're talking about our integumentary skin, our integumentary system. And let's talk functions at first. Okay, so one function of our integumentary system is protection. And this is a pretty big one, and it does it in a wide variety of ways. Okay, so one of the ways it's going to help protect us is it's going to contain keratin. We talked about this briefly on that previous slide, right? Keratin is a protein. Keratin is a protein that helps waterproof the skin. So it acts as a water barrier, helping keep water inside of the skin. It adds strength to the skin. Okay, so our integumentary system, we want it to be strong. We want our skin to be strong, right? Because it's our first line of defense. It's our first line defense against microbes, against mechanical injury, okay? and so we need it to be strong. In addition to that keratin helping with that, right, our skin is going to help us protect us from chemicals, from mechanical damage, like physical damage, like scratches and stuff like that, thermal damage, heat, it's also going to help protect us from bacteria, right? As long as we don't have an open wound, we should not have any foreign invaders be able to get into our system, through our skin at least. Okay, it also helps. So we've got keratin that's giving it the strength. It's protecting us from chemicals, mechanical, thermal, bacteria. Okay, it also helps protect us with UV protection. A UV protection is um, really important in the form of melanin. So we have these cells in our skin called melanocytes. Spelled it wrong. Okay, so we have this, these cells in our skin called melanocytes that produce melanin. Melanin is, is the pigment that gives our skin uh, color. Okay, and that color, when we, go out the, when we go out in the sun, most of us know that our skin gets darker, right? Well, let's talk about why it gets darker. Right? Our skin gets darker because the melanin is trying to absorb the UV light and protect the DNA that's in your cells from that UV light that can act to break down the, D, the DNA. That's why um, evolutionary-wise, okay, um, ancestors that were from closer to the equator had darker skin because they had higher sun exposure. And so they needed to produce more melanin to protect from that sun exposure. Okay, so our skin is gonna help us protect us from all of those things, right? So tons and tons of things that it's gonna help us protect, protect us from. Okay, in addition to protecting us from those things, our skin also, so a second function of our skin here is going to be to help prevent what we call desiccation. Desiccation is basically drying out. It's excess water loss. That's a C. Okay, so our skin is going to prevent desiccation. It's going to prevent us from drying out. Basically, it's going to prevent us from turning, turning into a dried up, dusty mummy. Okay, so in addition to that, it's going to also help us regulate body temperature. And remember, we're focused on the skin here. So let's talk about how the skin can help us regulate body temperature. So when we get too hot, right, when the temperature goes up too high, our skin can help us sweat because our sweat glands are located in the skin. It will also dilate our capillaries. Capillaries are these little tiny blood vessels in the skin. You can see some there in the diagram. Okay. And when we dilate a tube, the tube actually ends up getting bigger when we dilate the tube. And so if I dilate those capillaries, then the tube gets bigger, so more blood flows there. You know, some people, when they're especially light, you know, light skin, fair skin people, when they get really hot, you see them turn red because the blood is coming to the surface because the blood is made mostly of water. Water carries a lot of heat. 
And it takes a long time for water to boil. It takes a long time for water to cool back off. Okay? And so our body has a lot of water, in particular in the form of blood. And so when we get too hot, if we dilate those capillaries of our skin, then it allows the water to be near the surface of the skin more, which allows the heat to radiate off. If we are too cold, our skin does not shiver. That's our muscles. But our skin right, will constrict the capillaries. Right? And so if it constricts the capillaries, it makes those capillaries smaller or more narrow. So less blood is up near the surface. Therefore, less heat is escaping out into the, um, into the environment. Okay, so we've got our skin protecting us from all kinds of things, um, preventing us from drying out, regulating all our body temperature. Our skin also helps with production of vitamin D. I think we're on number four here. Yeah, and so production of vitamin D. So some sun exposure is good for us, it's important. Okay, um, we have the precursor for vitamin D in our body, but the sun exposure will convert the cholesterol molecules into the active vitamin, into the active vitamin D. Okay, so we are producing vitamins now. We're also, we're also releasing chemical waste. So in addition to cooling us off, the sweat helps reduce, helps release weight, waste. Okay. There is urea, which is a nitrogen waste, salt, uric acid, all present in that sweat that is leaving our body through the skin. And then, of course, our last thing our skin is going to do is going to help us with sensation. Touch, vibration, temperature, pain, right? Our skin plays an important role in sensation, a containing lots and lots of sensory receptors. So some of the sensory receptors that you guys will need, uh, Meisner's corpuscle, which, there we go. Meisner's corpuscle, which is gonna be light touch. These free nerve endings, you can see them right here. There's another chunk of them over here. These free nerve endings, which are sensitive to temperature, pain. These Piscinian corpuscles, these big giant wonky looking things here. Okay, the Piscinian corpuscles, those are gonna be important for deep pressure, deep touch, okay, uh, vibration. So those will be those Piscinian corpuscles. So those are some of the different um, sensation things that you guys will need to know. Okay, so let's look at what some of these other, what we call appendages do. So these parts of the skin here. So we have a couple of different kinds of sweat glands and oil glands in our skin. So we're gonna first look at what we call an ecrine sweat gland. Okay, there's your spelling for it right there, an ecrine sweat gland. There are these like purpley looking ones right here with the tube, they go up to the surface, up to through the pore. Okay, so an ecrine sweat gland, these are our most common sweat glands. These cover almost all of the body and they open directly onto the skin. So these open directly onto the surface of the skin and you have them all over your body. Okay, these secrete um, a mostly water-based substance. Okay, it's uh, clear. It's going to be a little bit acidic. And that's what's going to be released from these particular sweat glands. The other kind of sweat gland is what we call an apocrine sweat gland. Okay, an apocrine sweat gland, let's try to see if you had... A picture of one, you don't have a picture of one on this one. So an apocrine sweat gland. Apocrine sweat glands are found only in certain locations on the body. 
Okay. Apocrine sweat glands are in the genital region, so in the inguinal and the groin area, okay, and in the axilla, right, which is our um, armpit. So apocrine sweat glands are going to be in the axilla and the inguinal or the groin region. These apocrine sweat glands, they, become, they are associated with a hair follicle, or the ecrine sweat glands are not. The equine sweat glands, again, as you can see in the picture, they open right to a pore on the surface of the skin. Apocrine sweat glands are associated with a hair follicle. They become more active when you hit puberty. Okay? And these secrete a thicker substance. Okay? It's thicker, almost kind of milky fluid okay? because this is not mostly water, right? The equine sweat gland was mostly water, clear kind of fluid. This is a mix of the typical sweat from the ecrine sweat gland, but also includes fatty acids and some proteins. So that's where it becomes not clear anymore. These sweat glands are the sweat glands that make us stink, for lack of a better term. It's not the sweat itself that stinks. It's the bacteria on the skin that because you have proteins and fatty acids, they are eating that. They're breaking those proteins and they're breaking those fatty acids down. So when we bathe, we wash those bacteria off so they can't break down the sweat and make us stinky. It's the byproduct of the bacteria that make us stinky. Okay, so two types of sweat glands, apocrine and ecrine. You need to be comfortable with their different locations uh, and what they do a, um, and you know, the differences between the two. Let's see if I can not delete this by accident. Okay, so let's talk oil glands now. So let's look at these sebaceous glands. So your sebaceous gland, right there's your spelling, sebaceous or oil gland, that's going to secrete what we call sebum. Sebum is an oil. You'll notice these sebaceous glands are these things that look kind of like cauliflower on the hair follicle there. Sebaceous glands are always associated with a hair follicle as well. They secrete the sebum, which is important for keeping the hair soft. It's actually, sebum is actually antibacterial. It's, a, it's when these glands get clogged up that you start to develop pimples and stuff because you can't get, the oil can't get out. Okay, so the sebaceous gland is beneficial to us. We have them everywhere except for palms of our hands and soles of our feet. Okay, so we don't have them on the palms of our hands or the plantar surface of our foot, the bottom of our foot. These are going to be the two places where we don't have any of these sebaceous glands, which would make sense if those are places where we want not to be slippery, right? We want to be able to get a good grip using our hands and before we wore shoes then as well. Okay, so let's quickly look at hair and nails. Hair and nails are together with skin because they basically grow right out of the skin. They are considered appendages of the skin and they are included in, um, when we study skin, these are the, the best places to include these. Okay, so really what's important with hair, you're gonna label these parts on your diagram. What's important with hair is that we realize that it has a growth area, which is called our matrix. Right, so this area down here is called the matrix and it grows. Hair and skin grow the same, right? If I have this hair, this piece of skin, it's actually going to grow from down here at the bottom. And the top part is going to be dead. Okay? And we're constantly going to be replacing these cells down here. And so as these cells die, they get pushed further up. And that's how our hair is going to get longer. Right? When you cut your hair, it doesn't hurt to cut it. When you pull it out by the root, that hurts because the part that's hanging off your head is dead. The part underneath the skin is alive, growing, dividing. Okay? This is why when um, like you could take your hand right now and you could do a light scratch on the surface of your skin and it won't hurt because all those cells are dead. We're meant to be able to we, you know, lose those cells and it not be an issue. But a few layers down on the skin, you've got cells that are growing and regenerating and pushing up the older cells. So the older cells end up dead on the surface, 
while the newer cells are growing and developing down on the bottom. And we're constantly replacing hair, nail, and skin cells right? because we know they're getting damaged, they're getting torn up. That's why our hair is always growing, our nails are always growing longer. So the hair follicle is going to have this matrix where the hair is growing. A, um, the skin has a, a layer that is an area that where it's actually growing. A, and the nails will have that as well. Hairs also have associated with them, you'll see that sebaceous gland where the oil is released along the hair shaft. They have this little muscle called the erector pili muscle. A, you see this muscle here, if it contracts, right, it's going to get shorter like this. If it gets shorter like that, it's going to actually pull the hair so it stands straight up and down. Erector pili muscles are what um, we get goosebumps. That's what's contracting and making it bump or stick up. And our last part here is the nail. Okay? The nail also, like I said, again, has a matrix. Okay? It's what we usually call the nail bed, right? It's the part of the nail that is growing. Okay? It is under. You'll see this is all skin here. Okay? It's under and protected, embedded down in. These cells growing, dividing, growing, dividing, growing, dividing. So they push, push, push the old cells further out. So things out here in the free edge of the nail and such, those cells are dead. <coughs> we are meant to be able to lose those, to tear them, and it'd be okay because our nail is trying to protect this living tissue here. Okay, so you guys will need to, um, you've got kind of the basics of the functions of these main areas of the skin and stuff. Y'all will need to go through and, and label the parts from your structure list. And then we can start putting the two together in class, putting the parts together with more specific functions.